thanks for coming. We're really glad you're here. And this program is sponsored by the Dummerston Conservation Commission, and it's co-sponsored by the Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center. Uh, we have three more programs uh, coming up. We have Vern Gibbinger, who's going to talk about climate related to um, agriculture. And then we have Con Todd Menace, who's going to talk about uh, climate in our water systems. And then we have Tom Rogers, who's um, going to talk about wildlife. Uh, Todd Menace is the state river engineer, and Tom Rogers is the state bio uh, one of the state biologists. So we have a series of good programs coming up, and um, but it's delighted today that we have Mark Green. What a perfect person to have at a perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all know you, and, and uh, really appreciate what you do to keep us. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I, I think I'm going to take this off of here because I have a hard time standing still. Um, all right, so uh, in, just in terms of, of who I am, I, I mean, I, I suppose some of you know that I do some of the weather forecasting on Vermont Public Radio. <laughs> well, you, you know, I still run into new people all the time. Um, and, and I've been doing that for more than 35 years, let's just put it that way. Um, I started when I was five. Um, <laughs> So uh, it, it, certainly w wonderful to be to invited, he invited to here to talk about this. So let me just give you a little bit about why is there weather at the Fairbanks Museum? I mean, there's no particular reason that a museum has weather. That's not a normal function as far as uh, um, museums are concerned. So just a little bit uh, about the Fairbanks Museum. The Fairbanks Museum um, was founded by Franklin Fairbanks. He's one of the uh, nephews of the people that invented the platform scale. And the invention of the platform scale kind of revolutionized scales in the scale industry uh, really kind of took off and St. Johnsbury was the center of that uh, in the 1800s into the early 1900s. And, and even today the, the Fairbanks uh, company still exists, still makes scales. Um, so anyway, so Franklin Fairbanks himself though, the founder of the museum, um, he was fascinated with all aspects of, of nature, including the weather. So it, it turns out that uh, among his duties of, of running the, the manufacturing of uh, the, the scales and so forth, he kept incredible records in terms of details about the weather. Um, he was one of the early observers. Uh, before there was a weather service, they were trying to figure out, well, who should collect you know, these uh, weather records and so forth. Uh, so it turns out um, the Smithsonian Institute actually was one of the first organizations that actually collected weather records. So he was keeping weather records going back into the 1850s. And so we have some of those handwritten ones um, at the museum. It just gives us a little perspective on things. So in terms of the museum itself doing weather forecasting today, we have always been uh, keeping records of the museum uh, weather records starting in 1894. So we have a continuous daily record starting in 1894 from the same location, which is actually, in, in terms of uh, weather records in the state of Vermont, it is one of the oldest records that is in the same location. Um, Burlington's weather records go back several years earlier than ours. However, the Burlington weather records have moved around about six or seven different locations. Um, so to have a, a record at the same spot really gives us an excellent climate record, particularly when St. Johnsbury, for the most part, really hasn't changed. Um, and our observing location really hasn't changed either. So in other words, when we're comparing temperatures that we have today, we're comparing the same situation with what we were having in the 1890s. Uh, and that means that if there's a change, it's due to the climate changing and not to St. Johnsbury changing, which is not necessarily true. There are a lot of weather uh, climate records that are from locations where the location itself has changed so much that they try to do some adjustments to the temperatures and so forth, but it gets to be a real challenge in terms of measuring the temperature. You would think it would be pretty simple, it's actually relatively complicated in terms of getting a, a continuous type of record. All right, so thinking about the whole business of, of weather and climate. I mean, the, the bottom line 
is that weather is not climate. It is almost impossible to get people to separate the two of them. Because any time we have a hot summer, a cold summer, a, any of those weather events, people immediately start labeling that, oh, well, that's because the climate's changing. You cannot label any weather event a climate change because climate takes place over long periods of time. In fact, we're still trying to figure out what would be a, truly a good climate period. You know, is 10 years a good term average? Is 20, 40, 100, 1,000? There are lots of things that happen through the course of, of time and they change and, and what are they reflecting? Well, we're gonna talk about some of those things today, but the, the general idea is, you know, I mean, we have all of these day-to-day -day changes, all kinds of things that, that go on in terms of that. So if we're going to, to separate those out, um, one of the things that, that we should probably you know, kind of work on is, is the different elements that, that go into weather and climate. So I'm going to end up talking about a lot of different things, but in some ways it, it kind of breaks out into uh, really, I, I think, some pretty simple basic ideas. One, the sun is basically the thing that sends us energy. It's the system's energy source. All right, so that's pretty simple. Then, if you look at the surface of the Earth, the, le the largest thing is the oceans. 75% of the Earth covered with oceans. So if we can work with those two things in terms of just understanding how climate works, then we can add in other you know, details and so forth because, yeah, the, cl the climate's complex. Um, and it, it doesn't, of course, they can, it get any easier when you start adding in human effects. You know, what is that? You know, and how can you sort that out from the natural effects? So, all right, so first thing here, weather versus climate. And, and maybe, you know, I, I don't know if this will help. I don't know if this will change how you view some of these weather events. It's really tough. You know, I mean, um, I, I think the media, one, does a good job in terms of bringing people's uh, awareness levels up. Two, it's the media and they need your eyeballs and they need your ears and they're going to tell you all kinds of things because that's what they do, um, which is fine. So, uh, but now I, I, I rarely think anybody would attribute lightning to climate and I don't really uh, think that there's going to be any particular, you know, confusion there. Um, we do have uh, various things that go on during the winter that people, you know, uh, a particular kind of winter. We have an, what's known as an open winter. Um, you know, all of a sudden people are, you know, thinking, oh, well, the climate's warming and then all of a sudden we'll get a winter uh, or, well, one, two, three marches ago. We had the coldest march in over a hundred years. Oh, well that's, you know, people get that confused with climate because, oh, well that's happened because the climate's changing. No, it happened because it was cold. Um, <laughs> it, it, and, and I'm not trying to belittle climate. I'm, I'm trying to give you a, a kind of a full perspective on that um, because I think that's helpful. If you're going to make good decisions, you have to have good information to work with. Flooding, you know, I hear a lot about you know, flooding and how that may change as far as climate is concerned. Even the question about snow. I actually did a program for Vermont uh, resort, ski resort uh, owners back in the late 1990s. And uh, there was one gentleman who was part of that discussion and he said, well, you know, the what climate's changing and, and probably in another 10 years, you probably won't have much for ski seasons anymore. That's what people were saying 20 years ago. So hopefully I get you, you get a chance to go skiing this weekend. Um, so, um, and of course there's, you know, the benign part of weather too. You know, we often talk about, oh, well, this kind of storm and this flood and this snowstorm, but well, you know, nice spring weather, that's, that's nice as well. And, and I apologize, I mean, some of these slides may be a little, a little challenging to, to view, but um, so anyway, weather is all of that, including the nice, pleasant days. All right. So from there, oh, let me talk about all of that. Of course, you get all of those different days. And, and so when I think about climate, one of the things that I start thinking about is looking at 
all of those ups and downs. And so this is an example, and this certainly isn't climate yet, but at least um, it has some things built into that. So we're looking at, and, and I'm not gonna worry about getting into the details of that, although if you wanna see this, go to the National Weather Service uh, uh, website, Burlington's National Weather Service website, and they have this, you can check it out anytime. Uh, what it's looking at here, and, and, it's, and I think it's relatively simple, is that red is warm, blue is cold, and the, the difference is warmer than normal, colder than normal, or I should say colder than average. Average isn't normal, there's, uh, I won't get into the statistical discussion of that, um, but the general idea is that there is, oh, an average day in February. The average low temperature, actually I didn't check specifically Dummerston, but it's probably the average low this time of year is around 12 degrees and the average high is about 28 or nine. How many days in February do you expect to have an average day? <laughs> None. <laughs> I mean, you might get one here and there, but the idea of the averages is it takes into account the mornings that it's 30 degrees and the mornings that it's 25 below zero and you sort it all out and you get an average, which especially this time of year doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, and you can see that, you know, even in the course of a year, so this is a one year period it's up and down and up and down and up and down because that's the variety of weather that we happen to have. And, and we, uh, you know, here, we don't have the most extreme weather. We don't have, you know, the worst storms, but we probably have a lot of variety here because we're in, we're in a spot where different weather patterns like to shift around. So that's a typical thing. We see a lot of variety of weather here. Okay, so if you take all of those numbers, all of those details, the ups and the downs and the dry years and the wet years and snowy, non-snowy, and you basically crunch all the numbers down, then you get a 30-year average. At present, because this could change, but at present, 30 years is considered a climate period. Now you have to realize that when they decided that, they only had about 60 years worth of records. That was about 60 years ago. We now have about 120 years worth of records. Should our climate length be, you know, more than 30 years? Hard to say. It certainly works. Um, and, and so that's really, you know, so when you want to start thinking about climate, climate is at least a 30-year average. And that covers a lot of ups and downs, a lot of yearly, even decade type of changes that take place. And so you get a nice smooth number in terms of the average temperature or very specific average amounts of precipitation. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot. Um, you know, to say that on the average, uh, we get 100 inches of snow a year. What does that mean? Have you ever seen 100 inches of snow on the level? No, that all has to do with how you measure snow. So there's all kinds of fussy details. But the averages really try to give you a sense of what can you expect? Most years? Okay, well, every year we get snow. In some locations, it might be some years they get snow and some years they don't. Again, that would be blended into their averages, but we get a reliable supply of snow. Therefore, we have industries that work with that. And we get you know, plenty of pleasant weather as well. People come in vacation or they you know, uh, stay here and have vacation, you know, all that kind of thing. Gardening, okay, I don't know how many of you are gardeners. Obviously, that is tied in to weather and to climate. I'm guessing most of you don't have banana trees, okay? That's a climate thing, okay? You can have it inside. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, the idea here is, is that we have these things that we rely on. And if those things change, then some of the things that, that we enjoy, some of the things that we plan on, those begin to change. Has that happened before? Um, outside of Burlington, there are several towns that have different roads called Peachtree Lane and so forth. 
Because in the 1920s and, well, teens and 20s, Burlington actually had several peach orchards. It was actually quite a, a growing industry. And then in the 1930s, there were several winters that were extremely cold, and it basically killed all the peach trees. So, has the climate changed in the past? It sure has. Um, I hear a lot about maple sugaring and so forth, and people concerned without that in terms of an industry, but that's obviously depending on the different kinds of weather we have, and it would obviously change in terms of, of any climate change. And, oh, our foliage, you know, uh, hearing lots of things about, oh, the foliage is late this year. I think I hear that almost every year, but... Um, <laughs> So one of the things that, that I started doing, and, and I just did it this year, is I actually went through it. Now, uh, at the museum, one of the things, and this actually comes from Franklin Fairbanks, in addition to writing down specifically, here's the temperature, here's the barometer, here's the wind direction, he also left a space in his weather records called remarks. And he would write most anything generally to give you a little better idea. I mean, you can throw out, okay, today the high temperature was 80, the low temperature was 32, and you know, so on and so forth. That doesn't necessarily tell you what the day was like. So a lot of times he would, you know, beautiful day outside. That tells you a lot more than just a couple of numbers. And then he included other information. Oh, planted strawberries this morning, okay. But that also gives you an idea, okay, well, what kind of day was it, you know, what's he up to, that type of thing. Um, I do recall, let's see, um, North Church Steeple blew over in storm last night. Okay, so you can have a number on the wind, but it's much more helpful to know, oh, this was a serious windstorm. So those kinds of things I write down. In terms of the foliage, I had written off and on during the years the percent that I estimate that the, that the foliage had changed, you know, when was it peak, which is a very, you know, subjective sort of idea, but I started going back through the records and I actually put it in, and so I'm in the process of hopefully coming up with, yes, the foliage is late this year, or it's early, or it's brighter, or it's not so bright. It's hard to quantify. And there are other things. Uh, I hear this a lot, robins. Do you have any robins around here right now? Yes. A few of you, yeah? yeah? Okay. Is that because the climate changed? Mm. Well, it, it all has to do with why birds leave <laughs> or stay. <laughs> birds don't leave because they're cold. <laughs> Otherwise, chickadees wouldn't stay. <laughs> food, it's easy. If, they, if you keep food for them, they will stay. <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's as simple as that. Um, now, it, obviously, warm winters, cold winters, you still got to split your wood, so that kind of thing. All right, so, all right, so that's a little bit about weather and kind of blending into how climate fits into, you know, our activities and so forth, but what if climate changes? Well, guess what? Climate changes. <laughs> It always does. It always has. I have a favorite quote that I heard. Um, this is talking about um, the countryside in Virginia, that over the past few decades, I have noticed a considerable change and temperatures have gotten much warmer and our hay crop has suffered accordingly. Written when? Any idea? Any guess? 1860s. Hmm? 1860s. 1860s, pretty good. How about the 1760s? A guy named Thomas Jefferson was complaining about climate change. And what did he blame it on? People. His specific reason was that they kept cutting down trees and making huge pastures and it was affecting the climate. Which is true. It does change average temperatures and so forth. So, so climate changes and it that's, it's its modus operandi. It's what it does, it changes. Um, yes, I mean, with the dinosaurs, it's not quite that warm anymore, and woolly mammoths, it's not quite that cold anymore. But climate goes through all these variations. So, 
To give you a little perspective on that, uh, the next kind of thing that I want to talk about is to do a little bit about not just climate over the past hundred years and so forth, but what has the climate been doing over a longer period of time? So let's start out with, and I'll apologize right now. In order to describe this, I generally have to use graphs and charts. So if you don't really get into graphs and charts, eh, but it's numbers and so forth, we have to figure out some way to measure what I'm talking about. So basic graph here, and this is the past 2,000 years. Okay, these are the most recent years right here. This goes back into the 1600s here, We're going back to the year 1000 or so here, and finally back to about the year, well, there isn't a year zero, but you get the idea. Okay, so that's the past. Now, that's a, a relatively, you know, long period of time in terms of how much change. Okay, this is, um, this is in degrees Celsius, and the amount of change goes from about half a degree above the long-term average to about half a degree below. What's the geographic area? This is global temperatures. Okay. Yes. Where are you? R, R. W. Spencer? That's Roy Spencer. And, and where is oh, oh, Roy Spencer's the one that, that uh, created the chart. Yeah, now, how did he get the, um, the temperatures for um, the earlier period? I'm going to get, actually answer that very specifically. So um, if, if you'll bear with me, yeah, you're, you're right, because quite honestly, the thermometer was invented here. <laughs> Absolutely excellent question. And there are ways to estimate, and that's truly what we're doing, um, as best as possible what temperatures were like going backwards. I guess I had thought you would talk about the impact of um, air pollution and the volume of pollutants we are pouring into the atmosphere. Oh, okay, well. I have a long road here yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so in, in order to even address that issue, I, I think people need to have a better sense of climate and climate change and what it's been doing in the past. Um, and then I will talk about some of the things that we know about that are happening now. Okay. All right. Um, so just in terms of, so this is actually a slightly longer period um, going back 3,000 years. Um, and you can see, um, so this is actually um, it's the latest uh, data that this particular person had, uh, 2006. But, the gen but we're talking about thousands of years here. So different changes through this period of time. And, and they're historical changes, things that we know about. Hannibal taking the elephants over the Alps. Pretty famous story. Those Alps that he took those elephants through, you can't do that now because there's still glaciers in the way. Those glaciers are melting over the past three or 400 years, but at the time he brought them through there, which would be, uh, well, it's behind the here, um, there weren't, the, the glaciers weren't there. Okay, those happened after Hannibal. Um, then we get, um, and, and this is actually something known as the medieval climate optimum. Uh, so around the year 1000, Climate's warmer than it was today, or at least as warm as today. And at that point, the Vikings are out exploring things. And of course, probably fairly famous that they went and explored Greenland. Now, even a thousand years ago, Greenland was mostly ice. Why do they call it Greenland? Well, there's some sketchy idea that it was a real estate idea. <laughs> they wanted people to come to Greenland. It's nice and green. Now, all right, so it wasn't completely green. However, between the years about 900 and 1300, there was a warmer climate there than it is today. They were able to grow crops, mostly root crops, some carrots, I think cabbage, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they had a relatively well-established um, you know, society going on there at that time. However, one of the things that happened somewhere near the year 1400, and it's not necessary, uh, necessarily this particular drop, but we think, and, and this is, we have to guess, 
somewhere around the year 1420, nobody was coming back and forth from Greenland. It was like it just stopped. And eventually somebody went back there and realized all the people there had perished. The weather had changed. It had gotten much colder. They couldn't grow enough food to sustain themselves. And in fact, they were heading for, they didn't know it, the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age, probably, I, I guess the thing that I think of most is um, Charles Dickens in The Christmas Carol. He talks about snow and so forth and so on. Snow is a relatively rare thing in, in London, at least it is now, but in the Little Ice Age, it was very common. And, and there are lots of things that are, you know, sort of related to that. Um, Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates, you know, talking about, you know, skating on the canals. Um, these are things that were relatively common at that time. Temperatures were colder. Since the Little Ice Age, things have been warming up, okay? starting back in the, uh, actually the 1700s, although it was still, they had cold winters. They, they sometimes even refer to them as the cold winters of the revolution. Um, the late 1700s, there were a number of cold winters. Um, and, and so that's you know, pretty well documented and so forth. And, and so the little ice age kind of reaches its minimum somewhere around the year 1600. And since then, so starting in 1600, the climate has been warming. Okay, um, and, and yet even now we can think, you know, if you go back to the 1800s, 120, 150 years ago, we still hear a lot of stories about how cold it was and how much snow there was and so forth. Um, so that's just kind of, uh, just I, I wanted to give you a kind of a few thousand years worth of perspective on these changes that, that take place. Now, so to address the idea of no thermometers. I mean, that one of the things that I love of, about uh, doing any sort of science presentations, how do you know that? I wish people would ask me that more often. How do you know that? Okay, am I just making it up? It's possible. Um, well, I, um, so, all right, so we have a global temperature record, an accurate, um, relatively complete global temperature record going back to 1895. That's what we know, which means anything before that, there are you know, scattered temperature records. There actually is one in England, isolated thermometers that go back to the 1600s. That's kind of a nice stretch, and then you can start, sort of use that to start doing some comparison. But they use something called proxies. All right, what's a proxy? Um, I guess probably a good example of that would be tree rings. Okay, you can because we have such an a extended record of temperature and precipitation now, we can look at tree rings and what they've been doing over the past 100 years and say, okay, this is what tree rings, rings look like when the temperature gets warmer, colder, wetter, drier. And then you work backwards. Okay, because they do have uh, some tree ring samples that go back thousands of years. One of the trees that does this very well, the bristlecone pine in the Sierra Nevada out in the western United States. And as a result, they're not as concerned with temperature records there, but precipitation records are very critical in the western US in terms of understanding drought, long-term and short-term and that type of thing, or wet periods as well. And so that's one of the ways that we can do that. It turns out, the other thing that, that goes on on an annual basis, of course, the rivers and streams, they're constantly you know, putting sediment into the ocean and you can actually go through the sediment and the different amounts of minerals and other chemicals that are in there, they also relate to, and again, you can sort of, okay, this is the first hundred years and we have temperature records that you can sort of match that, and then you go back farther and you can extend that record back. Uh, in the case of ocean sediments, I believe we can go back tens of thousands of years, okay? And the same thing actually happens in the ground, okay, on dry land. So you don't have to go into the bottom of the ocean. Um, in certain locations where there's a long sediment record, especially if it hasn't been interrupted by um, glaciers and so forth, um, you get an opportunity to be able to do that. And that's how we can build out a 3,000 year, you know, sort of profile of temperatures. Yes. 
Texas we're at sea surface temperatures. Is that still correct? On, we're, we're, you mean on, I'm sorry? First notice the graph, the red sea surface temperatures. Let me go back to, um, uh, well, it's not showing up now, but I guess my question was, um, isn't it true that for the past 10,000 years, the average surface temperature of Earth has been around 57 degrees Fahrenheit? And that's what made it possible for human civilization to spread around the world. Um, I, I, would, I would say that... Um, and only during that period. I don't know that that's entirely temperature related. I mean, there are a lot of other things. But it is a fact that that stability of temperature over the past 10,000 years um, let that, now allow that to happen. The stability of temperatures is a bit of a misconception, and that's why I actually showed this particular chart, that we go from periods of many ice ages to periods where it's much warmer, um, and those variations actually is more a testament to the fact that the humans are very adaptable in terms of being able to take a set of circumstances and adapt to that. Um, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, that, that the climate's been very stable through that time period. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, so, so let's just extend that period since you talked about that. Um, I would actually extend that period back a little bit more. Um, and, and so this is essentially known as the interglacial period um, and about 12,000 years. So if you go back somewhere before 10,000 years ago, temperatures were considerably colder. Uh, 20,000 years ago, there were still glaciers. In, actually, until about 12,000 years ago, the last glaciers were finally gone in Vermont. Um, if you get back between 20 and 25,000 years ago, we still had between one and two miles of ice sitting over us. Okay, so why did it warm up that rapidly? We have no idea. We have some, we, well, I should say that, we have some ideas. We don't know exactly why. Um, and, and so... One suggestion is carbon sequestration by small uh, organisms. Can you... Let me... oh, okay, well, all right. So one of the things that did happen after the last glacial period is the temperature jumped up relatively quickly over a few thousand years and reached kind of its warmest point right around 8,000 years ago. Um, and at that point, um, Many of the glaciers that we now know of in many of the mountainous locations, they had retreated considerably. Like I said, the Alps didn't have any. Um, and so we end up with um, what they known as a, this absolute, absolutely uh, phenomenal period of time where there's a lot of growth. Um, all of the, the northwestern British Isles, they were covered with this wonderful forest and so forth. And since then, there's been a very slow decline with some ups and downs, but a gradual decline in terms of temperatures since 8,000 years ago. Now, let's extend the record even a little bit longer. Now we're going back to the, basically the entire glacial epoch. Um, uh, there is a rhythm, and I've got a couple of uh, slides that'll demonstrate that. But basically, the last interglacial period, the last really warm period of 10, 15,000 years, goes back about 120,000 years ago. It was nice and warm. And then the temperature crashed, and this is essentially considered the Ice Age. And then somewhere, again, around 10, 15,000 years ago, temperature jumps up, and here we are in what we know as an interglacial period. Um, and this is a pattern that's actually repeated itself in, in slight, with slight variation over about the past uh, 2.7 million years. There's been a relatively regular 100 year, 120 year, 120,000 year cycle of glaciers and interglacial periods. All right, so I had mentioned earlier about climate factors. What controls the climate? Um, ocean, that's an absolutely key thing because it is covering most of the surface and as a result, it's going to influence the, the temperatures 
the, the, the greatest, and of course, then you've got the water on top of that. Um, so oceans are a key thing to that, and in fact, there's something known as this global ocean conveyor circulation. Um, well, that's one word for it. There's all, it's also called the thermal hailing uh, cycle, but um, this is a deep water cycle that takes place where warm water near the surface eventually circulates around, and as it gets toward the poles, uh, let me see if I can find a demonstration of that. Uh, let's see, that's cold water coming up and warming. Uh, here's warm water coming up, oh, sorry, cold air coming up, cold water. Here, there it is, okay. Warm water, and this is very well known, this is the part of the Gulf Stream. The warm water comes up into here, it cools off, and it becomes cold water that actually runs at the bottom of the ocean. This circulation is not terribly well understood because it takes place over this enormous ocean area. It's very complex, it's not easy to measure, and there are different estimates on how long it would take, let's say, a parcel of water to make its way through this. It might be 500 years, it might be a thousand years. But in terms of thinking about how the ocean is going to affect our climate, and it does, then we have, if, if we had a better idea of this, we might have a better idea why the oceans seem to have cycles of, that last for decades in terms of warmer oceans and colder oceans. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit shorter term has to do with El Niños and La Niñas. This is something that we're continuing to start to understand. I still think we're starting to understand it. Um, I've seen a lot of things that, that try to describe exactly the basic kinds of weather that are associated with them, but it turns out there are even different kinds of El Niños and La Niñas. The bottom line, though, is that generally La Niñas produce very active hurricane uh, seasons in the Atlantic. We're in the middle of an, a La Nina. Not a surprise that the Atlantic had a lot of hurricanes. That's what happens during La Ninas. In El Nino years, the tropics are very quiet, at least here. Actually, it shifts out into uh, the Pacific. The Pacific becomes very active during El Nino years. So these are things that we start noticing. So I mentioned longer term ocean cycles. So here, and, and this goes back to, this is 1952, so essentially 1950 on the end of the scale. And it continues just past 2000. Uh, and these are the Pacific, the average surface temperature of the Pacific during that uh, 50 plus year cycle, or 50 plus years. And you can see it's colder here warmer here. And it has been somewhat identified is that the Pacific appears to have an approximately 30-year cycle of warm and cold. The Atlantic is lesser understood, but it appears to have a longer cycle. If you notice the same time period, 1950, a little past 2000, it's warmer here, colder here, warmer here. So this is it seems to be one cycle here. And, and so the, the Atlantic Ocean cycle may be, again, we don't have enough records to, to look back several thousand years and, and be sure, but it appears to have a longer cycle, perhaps in the 50 to 70 year range. Interestingly, if we match those cycles of the Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, on here they've averaged them both together. So the dark line is the average of those. And so we end up with, and, and so uh, let's see, the purple is the Pacific, the yellow is the Atlantic, they match, they don't match. But the bottom line is that the average of both of them was lower in the early 1900s. It was much higher going through the 1930s and 40s. It dropped in the 1950s through the 1970s and then it warmed since the 1970s. That matches up very nicely with the changes in temperatures that we've observed. 
Um, so this is the same black line that I just showed you, and the purple is the average temperature from the 1900s. This is the United States, I should say, not the entire globe, but the U.S. is bracketed by the oceans, and so that makes sense to compare that. And so you can see the ocean temperatures, or I'm sorry, the average temperatures in the U.S. mimic the temperatures that are in the ocean. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the sun. We're still learning about the sun. I mean, there it is. It's hard to miss. And yet, we don't understand a lot of things like, things like the sunspot cycle. I don't know if you're familiar with the sunspot cycle. Basic idea is, is the sun has a, a certain level of activity. It seems to be, uh, one way to, to sort of measure that is the number of sunspots. Measuring sunspots goes back to the invention of the telescope. The knowledge of sunspots actually goes back much earlier than that. Uh, over 2,000 years ago, Chinese uh, observers were looking at sunspots, literally looking at them. One of the jobs of the Chinese, or the royal Chinese astronomer, was to stare at the sun until all he could see was the sun. But as a result, he could see sunspots. <laughs> Not recommended now. Um, <laughs> all right, so anyway, but yes, Galileo, invention of the telescope, suddenly we can observe them safely. Uh, he's not looking through his telescope to see them. He actually let the light go through the telescope and it shines on some kind of surface and so you can safely observe what the surface of the sun looks like. The weird thing was, so he starts observing and other people are observing sunspots back in the 1600s and then all of a sudden they quit. Now, they didn't have any records prior to that, so are sunspots a normal thing or not a normal thing? They had, really didn't know. And then all of a sudden, in the, in the early to mid-1700s, more sunspots, and then this very noticeable, very regular 11-year cycle of sunspots gets going. So now the question is, is that normal? Okay, well, we've had, you know, been more than 300 years, but the sun's been around a lot longer than 300 years, so we can't, you know, be absolutely certain about that. And so we're learning about the sun, but let's face it, the sun is our energy supplier, and it makes sense that the energy from the sun is going to have a significant effect on our weather and our climate. So, sure. Yes, it has. And that has not affected temperatures on Earth because the atmosphere is not warmed by the rays of the sun coming to Earth. It's Earth's warming. Okay, don't, don't, don't get ahead of me. You're stealing all my good lines. Okay? Y yes, I, I will, I, I'm going to address that. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. She was asking about whether the, the sun, like all stars, gradually increases um, its, its energy output. And that's something that we have observed. Okay. Well, the, <laughs> okay, we won't get into effects just yet. Um, so this is the output of the sun relative to surface temperatures. Um, and so this is going back into the 1870s. So some of it obviously would be estimates, but the, in, the red is the increase in the energy of the sun's output, and the black is the change in temperatures. Um, another sort of same idea, but I think it's just a little more clear. Uh, the temperature is in blue, the solar activity is in red, and you can see that they parallel each other somewhat. Now, we still don't understand entirely exactly the mechanism between the sun and its variation and the temperatures and, and the variation. So it's not a direct correlation. In other words, if the sun's spot activity does, increases, it doesn't mean automatically the temperature increases or vice versa. Um, but we're learning more about the sun and its sunspot activity. In fact, this was a prediction back uh, a, a decade ago of the sunspot cycle that we're currently in. And they estimated at that time the sunspot cycle would be stronger than the previous one. However, it turns out 
This was a new prediction just a couple of years after that. Then they were predicting, well, maybe it's about the same or a little bit lower. And so eventually we get to the actual cycle now that we're into here. The most recent sunspot cycle has been about half that of the previous sunspot cycles. What does that mean? It means there were fewer sunspots. We don't exactly know what the sun is up to. We have some predictions that say the sun is going into a quiet period for the next 40 or 50 years. We don't know that. It's just a prediction. So understanding that and then figuring out how the sun's uh, energy is related ex specifically to our weather, those are all challenges that we have. So one other thing that uh, has been noted, the length of the sunspot cycle. So over here we have, this would be 12 years of a sunspot cycle, this would be 10 years. And it turns out that longer sunspot cycles are associated with colder temperatures. Shorter sunspot cycles are associated with warmer temperatures. We still don't know why. We can make some guesses about that, but nobody has an answer to that just yet. Okay, so, talked about the ocean, talked about the sun. Now we need to talk about the atmosphere because that's where all of this interplays. Okay, um, yes. Would, would this be a good moment to take a, a break and people can, there's some um, refreshments downstairs. And, oh, sure. And there's, there's a restroom here in the back and there's two in the back downstairs and, and just come back as quickly as you can so we can get started. Again. Sure, well it's about, uh, it looks like it's five of, or a little bit, close to five of 11. Maybe we can get back together about 11 or 11.05. That'll be fine. Yeah. Yes. Sure, yeah. okay. Um, all right, so from here, so I talked about the, uh, the sun and the ocean, so let's get to the atmosphere. Okay, so atmosphere, a very thin covering around the globe. I mean, thin enough that if you, uh, you know, get a view getting up into, uh, this is actually taken from a balloon. Um, they can actually say, actually there's a school group, and you guys should check into this. They have a school group out in California. They're actually sending up balloons and sending back pictures from the earth. It's really cool. So anyway, but see how thin the atmosphere is. So when we talk about the atmosphere, really the lower layer of the atmosphere, um, which would basically be approximately 10 miles above the surface of the earth, that is where all the weather happens. Even the very top of the atmosphere is only about, and it kind of depends on how you want to define it, but between two and 400 miles above the Earth. That's still thinner than the skin of an apple compared to the apple. So when we talk about the atmosphere, it's pretty thin. Okay. All right, so uh, just briefly, you know, the greenhouse effect is the fact that the Earth's atmosphere has different gases in it that allow sunlight to travel through. The sunlight hits any surface and then it re-radiates that, and the radiation from that, coming back into the atmosphere, gets absorbed and re-radiated in the process. That's what heats up the atmosphere. So, greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide comprises about four hundredths of eight of one percent. Water vapor ranges, but up to four percent of the atmosphere is water vapor. And then other greenhouse, greenhouse gases are less than or approximately one hundredth of one percent. Um, and again, you know, in terms of the atmosphere, the sunlight comes in. The sun doesn't heat the atmosphere almost at all. I think it's, it's a very few tiny percentage points. Essentially, the heating takes place when the sun hits something. It's the ground, it's the ocean, it's you and me, it's the buildings, it's the pavement, all of that then that's radiated back out into the atmosphere and that's how the atmosphere is heated. All right, so from there, we can measure, you know, all of these different gases, but the thing that we don't understand and the thing that's the biggest player, the biggest greenhouse gas is not carbon dioxide. The biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. And this has been well known, it's not uh, uh, any mystery to that. Um, and, and so here's the, the big unknown, because it is the major greenhouse gas. What we don't know is that as it increases, does it retain more heat? Does, in the process of it, does it actually, that energy, does it block some of the energy that's coming in from the sun? In other words, clouds. Um, 
The transfer of energy from the atmosphere to the oceans, to the energy that takes place to create storms and so forth, how does that work? We don't have an exact idea. We have a really good idea, but we don't know exactly how that works. So from there, the next thing is, of course, us. Humans have been affecting the climate probably since the 17 or 1600s. If you go back before that, there probably aren't enough people to make a significant difference in the climate, although local climates, no question about it. Um, good example would be maybe the British Isles, because the British Isles, uh, just uh, an example in, in, in Ireland, Ireland was covered with forest. Until about, well, that lasted until somewhere around three or 4,000 years ago. There are now places in Ireland that actually can't even grow grass because when they cut down the trees, it changed how the soil got held, and then the weather that was coming in wasn't able to regenerate the soil and so forth. So humans have been affecting the climate for a while, but now there are a lot of us, plus seven billion and on the way up. And so most of the world's population lives in cities, and there's a lot of material there, there's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of gases, a lot of pollutants, that's not the only effect, though. That's one of those, that's a very visual sort of thing. One of the things that we think is an important, significant uh, contributor has to do with, oh, well, that's just more people there. Um, <laughs> one of the important things that, that humans seem to be doing that, that affects the climate has to do with land use. Land use, just as in a general rule. An example, the Amazon rainforest. Now, the Amazon rainforest is a rainforest because, and, and this is something you guys probably know, the water cycle, right? Okay. One of the things about the water cycle in the Amazon is that it's in the trees. So in other words, the trees, the water comes up from the ground, gets into the tree, the tree actually releases the water vapor into the air. It's enough water vapor that it creates clouds. And the clouds grow during the morning hours, during the afternoon, somewhere between three and four o'clock, almost a reliable type of thing. It rains, and it rains, and it comes in down into the soil, and of course, it cools off the atmosphere, so the clouds disappear, and it goes back up into the trees, and the cycle happens again the next day, and the next day, and so forth. So, they got this idea, hey, well, we've got this very reliable rain source, let's cut down the trees and turn it into pasture. Which means, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, the soil, and the Amazon rainforest is not like the soil in your backyard here. They don't have eight inches of loam or two feet of loam. Two inches, maybe. And so what happens is the nutrients are constantly getting cycled through. And as long as the trees are there, everybody's happy. But if you take the trees away, the soil is so thin that it can't support this cycle. And so what happened? It got drier in the Amazon because they cut down the trees which meant you couldn't grow the pastures and so on and so forth. It was a real, real mess, still is. Pavement, okay, now, we don't think of having a lot of pavement around here, although obviously there's some. Um, it's one of the things that we actually at the museum paid attention to about 25 years ago. They paved our parking lot and we moved our weather station about 70 yards, 60 yards, to keep the heat from that from affecting our temperature record. Now that's just, that, that, we had the ability to do that. Um, there are a number of places like uh, airports and so forth where what used to be a, weather, a set of weather instruments sitting out in the middle of a field is now a set of weather instruments surrounded by tarmac. You don't think that affects the temperature? Of course it does. So, Humans are definitely uh, affecting things that way. So, so land use of farming, farming and, and different farming practices have a huge impact on local temperatures and climate. All right, so let's localize this, you know, because I can, you know, all the global stuff is great. It's very interesting. But since I have this wonderful set of records at the museum, let's use them. All right, so 
It is warmer in St. Johnsbury than it was at the beginning of our weather records. No question about it. Okay? It's warmer in the United States than it was going back over 120 years. It is warmer across the globe. It is absolutely incontrovertible. I don't think anybody that I know thinks that the globe isn't warming. Okay. All right, so let me just uh, use a sample of, of the museum's weather record. So, so this is the annual temperature average, January to December. Um, and so it starts here at around 42. There's, there's two lines in here. The difference is we have what we call a running mean. And, and what that does is it's, it tends to take out some of the, well, you can see, the blue line is very jagged, and it's kind of hard to see any trend in that, or harder to. But if you average that out over seven years, and you just keep advancing the seven years that you're using, so you're using that same average, and you're going forward. And so this is the seven-year running average, and you can see a little bit easier the trends that are taking place. Um, and so during this period of time, um, 50 years, the temperature climbed three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. The interesting thing is that that happened from 1894 to 1950. Since 1950, the temperature has continued to climb, but not three and a half degrees. The climb since then is about 45 degrees here and 46 degrees here, one degree in the past 60 years. Okay, just, you know, I'm just using data here. Um, so from there, other things is the annual precipitation. And this is something, um, it's been, you know, one of the things I've been trying to, to understand, and especially in terms of how it's related to our temperatures. Um, and this is a record that goes back, it's hard, hard to see the writing here. This is 1945. That was when I was able to, to get a reliable sense of this here. So. Starting in the 1940s, average annual precipitation just over 35 inches. Now, it's up at around 43 inches. So if that's a significant increase in the past 60 or 70 years. Um, so our average annual precipitation has definitely been going up. Now, in the process of going up, also note wide variations. It's one of those things you know, it, it, just in terms of, you know, so we're going to have very dry years, we're going to have very wet years. Averages are made up of, of that, okay? And then snow. Well, actually, before I do this. So since the 1940s, snowy or less snowy? What do you think? Okay, all right, let's use the numbers. <laughs> so 1945, average snowfall in St. Johnsbury, 75 inches. Latest number is 90. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm going to ask you to hold your question till. Okay. Um, so, um, and, and, and within that, that's not, this is not the snowiest period during that. In fact, and some of you, I'm going to guess, if you were here in the late 60s, early 70s, you have to remember those years. I do. Because in the late 60s and early 70s, we had four incredibly snowy winters in a row. And from those four years has come the remark, well, it always used to snow more. <laughs> and it was. It was very, very snowy at that time. And that's when, so the average in St. Johnsbury, and this is a 10-year average, the 10-year average was up to 100 inches in St. Johnsbury. Okay, so since then, I suppose you could say, you know, depending on when you want to start on your uh, graph, you can say, oh, it's getting less snowy, at least since the 1960s. Um, actually, it's actually held pretty close to this 90-degree figure, lots of ups and downs, but pretty close to that 90-degree figure um, over the past um, several decades now. Um, and that actually includes the absolute snowiest winter that we had, 2007-2008, and the least snowiest winter, which was 2015-16. Okay. All right.
I hope that you, I, I really hope that you, that you laugh about this. I know that there are certainly some serious things that we're talking about, but I think, is it a Buddha thing? We're all getting older, but are you laughing? I'm not sure if that is true or not. But somebody said that to me and, and attributed it to Buddha. Anyway, and I always remember that. You know, we're all getting older, but are you laughing? Okay, so we're all dealing with this climate stuff, but are you laughing? Okay, so this, this is my job. I forecast the weather. <laughs> Forecasting the climate really is more of a hobby, um, and it's something I'm f absolutely fascinated with, and I try to use a lot of the resources and, and things that I can understand as a scientist to, to try to, 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 you know, understand some of this. So let's at least give you a sense of what I think we may or may not be seeing. Or, or maybe, maybe better yet, maybe it's just important to just think about what the possibilities are. So one of the things, as I mentioned, understanding the sun. One of the things that happened, and I'm not gonna go through all the charts, but um, in the early 1800s, there was a period of time when the sunspot numbers decreased. They didn't disappear, but they decreased and the weather got colder. We don't know why. We don't even know that that's related. But they've been working specifically on that question, and there's a, um, is an, an Israeli scientist, um, and he's worked specifically on something called cosmic rays. Why is that important? And how does it relate to the sun? Well, cosmic rays aren't from the sun, they're from other, uh, uh, other suns, other stars out there. Here's how the sunspot number may factor into that. When the sunspot number is lower, the sun's energy is not quite as strong, it actually allows more cosmic rays to come into our atmosphere. And that has been shown, at least in theory, to create more clouds. More clouds would do a couple of things. It would increase the precipitation, which we have noticed. It would also block some of the sunlight from coming in, which could potentially cool the temperatures. Is that what happened in the 1810s, 18-teens, 1820s? We don't know. But it is one of the ideas that they're working with. So that's one of the things that we're trying to understand. Next, the ocean cycles that I mentioned. So this is going back to 1900. Oceans are a bit warmer, warmer here, colder particularly 50s into the 60s and 70s, and we did notice a change in the temperatures at that point. And then since then, the oceans have been warmer. Now, is the next stage colder ocean temperatures? I'm not gonna predict that, okay? We don't have enough information to be able to know that. Like I said, there's that complex cycle within the ocean that may take place over hundreds of years. So we're learning about this, we're paying attention to it, but how is it gonna play out in the immediate future? Not really sure. But somebody that's smarter than I about this, um, has been working with a combination of the sun and the ocean and humans, and he's come up with this prediction of temperatures. Now this starts back in about 1990. This is his prediction of temperatures through about 2030. This is the prediction from the IPCC of global temperatures. And so this is where we are uh, up to this point. Actually, this, oh, I think I have a later one, hang on. Yes, okay, so this is uh, the prediction actually, the one I showed you from before ended in about 19, or 2012, so this one continues out here. So this is his prediction, this is the IPCC prediction. Now the, the, there's absolutely a huge spike that took place with the last El Nino that took place in 2015 and 16. Um, but this is the current reading back down in here. So, um, so people are trying to, to figure this out. They're using combinations not of just human activity, uh, but of other things. Um, you know, the ocean is absolutely a player in this. The sun is absolutely a player in this. So I think to ignore them would actually do a disservice to anybody that, you know, if you have an, an industry like the ski industry or maple sugaring, um, anything, well, anything that's related to climate and 
in some ways, what isn't at the, uh, at the end of the day related to that climate. If you don't have a good forecast, you can't make appropriate plans. You can't make appropriate decisions. And so understanding it, it, this is not, it hasn't been completed. Nobody knows exactly what the temperature is going to do next. But getting a better understanding of it will help all of us in terms of going forward. So, <laughs> there are people that think you can just ignore this. <laughs> um, I don't think most reasonable people think that, but I just put that out there. I don't think that that, you know, that is some people's you know, course of action. I'm not doing anything. Okay, but one of the things that I'm very encouraged about is all the things that we can do, all the things that we are doing, all the things that are potentially uh, out there in, in the future. Um, solar panels, wow. In the last 10 years, the number of solar panels and solar farms in, in Vermont has just exploded. Um, I'm actually, you know, and this is just personal, I throw out opinions because I can. Um, well, um, I'm not as big a proponent of wind energy. I am a bigger proponent of solar energy, most and, and because there are lots of roofs out there. <laughs> um, and roofs uh, are already part of the landscape. Um, a 400 foot tower is not part of the landscape. Now, some people find them very attractive and, and I'm not gonna question that. Just for me personally, um, I, the idea of the solar panels is something that, that appeals to me. Okay. Um, and of course, they're doing marvelous things with transportation. They're doing some questionable things with that too. I'm not really confident about this whole automatic driving system. <laughs> um, but, but that's not necessarily a, a, a climate thing. Um, but the United States, you know, we love our cars. So if we can get better at how we transport things, whether it's using fuel more efficiently, changing the kind of fuel we use, changing how we think about our driving habits, all of that, that's all part of that. Um, and the, the other thing that, that I'll mention too, I guess I can't be a pessimist. I know there are things that could happen and may happen, but I am always impressed with how humans come up with solutions to this. And I'm talking about thousands of years ago. People figured out, oh, if we dam up this river, then we can irrigate things. Um, I mean, they were irrigating back in the southwestern deserts over a thousand years ago. They already had a, a system of irrigation in place. So humans come up with solutions to, the, to this, and I'm just, I'm feeling confident that we're gonna to continue to, to come up with solutions, but part of having solutions is having you know, good information going into that, okay? I'm still convinced the climate is going to change whether we take a part in it or not. And so I guess we'll finish up with Mark Twain. <laughs> now I know he didn't say this, but I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> that if you don't like the climate, just wait a few decades. <laughs> Guarantee it'll change. Be careful what you wish for. Okay. Um, all right, so that's what I have for information. It's 11.30, kind of where I thought I'd be. So, do you have some questions? I have one. Yes, ma'am. One of the last charts that you showed, you mm -hmm. mentioned the IPCC. Yes. What is that? I'm sorry, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She was asking what the IPCC was. Um, and, and so um, it's a group of, not scientists, um, it's actually a group of governmental agencies and, and their personnel who take uh, scientific information in and then create um, these different reports um, about you know, possible climate scenarios into the future. Okay. Yes. So uh, going back to the same chart, um, that panel sort of represents, in my mind, uh, like the 97% of scientists, I mean, like you say they're not scientists, but they take the scientific studies, they represent the 97% of scientists who believe that there, or, you know, there's climate change happening because it's man-made, so they 
a man. And the earlier your lower bar there is sort of one scientist's uh, theory. Is that, would you interpret that the same way? Um, there's been a lot of question about whether 97% is an accurate number. There's a, and I, there's no particular reason to get into that question or not. I, just uh, for comparison, there are also 30,000 scientists that have signed a decree saying that the other 97% are wrong. So, um, so okay, so, but, but let me uh, address that question specifically. Um, so, so this is um, from the IPC. So it, it's not the scientists. This is actually a governmental interpretation of the science. And there are a number of scientists um, within that that actually disagree with what the IPC has, IPCC has put out. Um, I use this not because it was one person's idea, he's actually working with a team of people, but I use this because if this is the projection and these are the measurements, then at this point, his model has some merit to it because his model to this point, and it may not be right 20 years from now, but to this point, it seems to be mimicking the Earth's changes more closely than the IPCC. So that's, that's the reason that I included it. It was not as a single person's idea, but, I, and I think an important distinction in terms of how scientists view climate is that most scientists that work with observations feel that the computer models are not accurate. Um, and, and so I think there's, there's a definitely there's truly a division in scientists in terms of people that work with observations and per people that work with climate models, um, computer models. Um, and so they're, they're probably, each, each of them has some, some merit to it. There's probably some middle ground as there often is, but um, that's when I often hear any distinction or differences that most people that are working with the numbers and observations don't usually paint as dire a picture as people working with computer models. Okay. That, that's yes. a related question. Sure. Could you say a little bit more about the kinds of data and modeling that those two predictions reflect? Is there a, a clear distinction between what... Oh, the, the, the methodology? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so they're both using computer models. The, the, the critical thing in the computer models here is they're assuming that carbon dioxide is the major driver in climate. And, as a, and there are other factors that are built into it, but because they use that as the key factor and because the projection that carbon dioxide levels will increase, th therefore their computer models also follow that, okay? In this computer model, it does take into account carbon dioxide, but it also puts much more weight on sun activity and ocean activity. And I think that's the difference that you're seeing there. Okay? Yes? A uh, couple of questions. The, mm -hmm. uh, I understood that uh, the release of the, the, the methane, which is in the permafrost, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, been uh, melting, uh, uh, has a greater effect than carbon dioxide by, by a, a large measure. And uh, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, coral, uh, bleaching of coral, which seems to be, uh, I mean, I don't know, has that happened before? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so the first thing about methane. Methane as a greenhouse gas is a, is, and, and so what they talk about is the effectiveness of these different gases. And so a very small amount of methane uh, has, um, has the ability to absorb a lot of radiation and re-release re it, and therefore heat up the atmosphere uh, much more effectively, think of it as being more efficient uh, than carbon dioxide or water vapor. So that's, um, and yes, uh, methane ha is being released. Um, whether that, that is playing into what we're seeing now um, is very uncertain. Now, so what's happening in the Arctic we know the temperatures have warmed much more in the Arctic than they have uh, near the equator. Um, but one of the things that's been happening uh, in the Arctic region is it has been much cloudier. There's been basically an increase globally, it appears, in water vapor. And that would absolutely account for warmer temperatures, especially in the winter, 
um, because uh, water vapor basically traps uh, the heat. It, it is the, the primary greenhouse gas. So, um, so is, it, is it because of the methane? You know, it's, it's one of those, it's a, a great and thoughtful question. It's something we have to pay attention to, um, but I don't think anybody has a specific answer on that. Uh, second part of your question I've already forgotten. <laughs> The coral, thank you. Um, and and I, I don't know a lot about the coral bleaching other than I know that it has to do with ocean acidification, um, which is not to be confused with ocean levels. Okay, Ocean acidification has to do with the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the ocean. Because um, carbon dioxide um, uh, mixed with water creates carbonic acid. And so that's my understanding of it. Now, again, I am not an oceanologist. I don't know all the details, but it's my understanding that, and, and so the oceans have more carbon dioxide because there's more carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. Um, that would increase um, the amount of carbon dioxide that would be stored in the oceans. Okay. Um, so I can't tell you much. I, I don't know uh, enough about, you know, like past bleaching episodes to tell you, uh, but it, it doesn't have anything to do with ocean ocean levels in terms of whether they're, they're rising or not. It has to do with the, acidi the acidity of the water. Not temperature. Uh, it may have to do with temperature. Again, I'm, <laughs> you're, you're definitely outside my field here. <laughs> okay. Yes. Because the oceans absorb carbon and have been becoming a carbon sink, and that's why they're acidifying. But, but they've always done that. I mean, that's, that, you know. Yeah, but, but so much more so that this phenomenon May I just ask them about this chart? Sure. The, the, it cites a chart that is over 10 years old from the IPCC. And the one source of this other um, kind of wavy line at the bottom is, I take it, a scientist at Duke University? Yes. A scaphida, I believe is his name. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I haven't heard you mention it all. <clears throat> sudden use of, of uh, carbonized, uh, fossilized carbon, and uh, where do you stand on what our policy should be in that direction? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I mean, basically once you get to the Industrial Revolution, so going back to the 1850s, um, is when we started using a lot of fossil fuels, um, and that in general has accelerated, and that would be the, the major contributor to the increase in carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere. I don't think anybody you know, questions or challenges that. The only thing that I will say that has an additional effect to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is that as the temperature warms, the oceans actually release carbon dioxide. As the temperature cools, oceans actually absorb more carbon dioxide. So. That's, that's a contributing factor, um, and, and in fact, um, I don't have a chart with me, but the Mauna Loa record, which is the, the longest continuous uh, record, goes back to about 1950, they show you see a cycle um, in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The reason it's going up and down and up and down is actually the temperature on the Earth, at, at, or I should say next to Hawaii. As the temperature increases, then the carbon dioxide increases as the temperature, I'm sorry, decreases as the temperature lowers. The, I've got that backwards, hang on a second. As the, as the oceans warm, it releases carbon dioxide. So the cycle has to do with the, just the annual temperature cycle in Hawaii, okay? Um, so in, you know, in, in terms of policy, uh, I'm, I don't generally get into policy. I, I, would, I would simply kind of go back to, to my old standard common sense sort of thing. If you got a material that, was, that took hundreds of millions of years to make and we're getting rid of it in a few hundred years, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, and obviously all the other things that, that are associated with it, uh, the different kinds of pollution, not just carbon dioxide, but all kinds of different pollutants. The fact that we know how to do things better now all of that suggests to me that we could certainly do a better job. So without having a specific policy point, that's what I would say, that if we use common sense and do, you know, do what we already know how to do, I think we would probably end up using fewer fossil fuels. Okay. 
And, and that would be good? I, I, yeah, because of all the things that are associated with it. I mean, just on my way down, I was listening to NPR, and they were talking about um, you know, the potential for opening up drilling off of the coast of uh, Florida, I believe. Um, and they were talking to somebody who effectively stopped it in California and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of problems associated with drilling oil that have nothing to do with the, you know, the, the other end of, of using the carbon fuels is just the whole drilling process creates some serious environmental uh, concerns. So, um, so yeah, I basically, if we can do it better than I think we ought to. Okay. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Weather, I know. <laughs> in the 1970s, I remember there was a big snowstorm here in Vermont, and I was like surprised at the lightning and everything that was going on associated with the storm, because I always associated lightning and thunder mm. with summer. Yeah. And I thought, is this rare, and what is this about? Yes, it's rare. Um, it happens usually during very strong storms or Every once in a while, we'll get essentially um, like a summer squall line, a, thumber, some, you know, a line of thunderstorms, but it'll happen in the winter. And in those circumstances, it's a pretty eventful thing. You can get like six, six inches of snow per hour. Yeah, it, I mean, it pours snow. Um, so in order to get that to happen, you have to have clouds that grow taller, and the taller clouds are what create the lightning. It also turns out that snowflakes are better at holding a static charge than water droplets. And so actually having, in a summer thunderstorm, one of the reasons that they build up static uh, charges in the top of the cloud is because the top of the cloud has snow in it, not raindrops. So snow is actually in, in that way kind of effective in, in terms of, of static electricity. Um, so, but again, it only happens in very powerful storms uh, or in these squall line type of things that happen. So, mm -hmm. yes, um, is that the one in '78? I think so. Yes, I yeah, I, I was in Connecticut at the time. We had 40 inches of snow and 15 foot snowdrifts. It was the best storm. I would <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about mm? you know, weather here. The climate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So some of us who are concerned about rivers and sedimentation have been walking around myself mostly saying we're getting more uh, intense storms now than we used to. So we'll get an inch and a half or two inches of rain in a shorter period of time. And then I say, and that's going to continue. But I think what you just told me today is that I can't really go around and say that. That seems more like a weather pattern than a climate change. Mm -hmm. or, so should I be attributing that to the weather pattern right now, or is that even what's happening today? There's no pattern to it. And it just seems like we're getting, it seems to me that we're getting more intense thunderstorms with more uh, like heavier rains, therefore causing more sedimentation to come off the, off the side, especially post I read. And I don't want to go around and, and, and prophesize mm -hmm. it when, when it may not be true. Right. So the couple of things about that, and you're asking about precipitation and, and how, it, how it may be changing, um, is that globally and specifically at the museum, so it's one of those, you know, we can see sort of these global averages, but I, it's nice to be able to say at the Fairbanks Museum, as you can see, our precipitation has definitely increased during the, the period of time of our observations. Um, and as a result, and, or I guess and the other thing that I noticed is that we have generally higher moisture content through the year. And one of the ways, that, and I sort of infer this by the fact that the temperature range at the museum has gotten smaller. In other words, from the morning low temperature to the afternoon high temperature, that average has shrunk from about 25 degrees down to about 19. That's attributable to the fact that there'd be more water vapor in the atmosphere. It's much more noticeable in the winter. Therefore, your winter nighttime temperatures would be warmer. Um, but getting back to your specific question about rainfall events, that's something that has been noticed globally. Now, will it continue? Um, I, I, I don't know, except that with more water vapor in the atmosphere, you would expect that to happen. The other side of that coin is, if, if the atmosphere 
maybe responding to the oceans or the sun is at this moment getting a little bit cooler. I'm not even suggesting that's under major climate change or anything, but just is, is the next decade going to be a little bit cooler? If that's the case, one of the things that happens with water is that if you cool water vapor off, it collects into droplets. And so a cooling of the atmosphere might actually release more rain. Um, so, and again, I don't, I don't know that anybody knows what the temperature is going to do specifically over the next decade. Um, I don't think you're wrong in saying, though, that those events have increased, and they certainly, I wouldn't see any reason for them to decrease in the next, you know, decade. Okay. Yeah. Some questions about thermometers. Okay. Uh, I had a greenhouse, and so I was using minimum maximum thermometers to keep track of the temperatures. Mm -hmm. And I found a great variation. I had three different thermometers and three different temperatures. <laughs> so I wonder if what you could suggest about getting an accurate thermometer. If OK. Well, a couple of things about that. If you get the same kind of thermometer, then the chances of it being the thermometer are less. They were the same. Oh, OK. <laughs> so it is amazing the differences that you can find in temperature going in just short little distances. Um, some of it has to do with exposure to sunlight versus wind, uh, shading, all of that. Those are all pronounced effects on, on temperature. Temperature is actually, so you know, we talked about the average temperatures and the climate temperatures and so forth. Temperature is actually one of the fussiest things to measure that way. Um, and, and even location, so um, official thermometers if they are the glass thermometers, are five feet above the ground. If they are, they, they have these uh, electronic sensors now, the official height for those is seven feet above the ground. But they are specific heights because if you change the height of your thermometer, you're gonna change the temperature. And sometimes a lot. The difference from five, and they actually did a study in Burlington, Vermont, on the temperature from five feet down to one foot. And they, on one morning, observed a difference of 15 degrees. So the placement of your thermometer is absolutely critical as far as that goes. So my, usually my, 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 or my fallback position is your thermometers were correct. It's a matter of where they were located, and they, they were telling you what it was in that spot. Okay. Now, it's possible there may be a slight error in, in the thermometers, but the chances are pretty low on that. Uh, the margin of error is usually within a degree, let's say. So if you were observing within a degree, I wouldn't think about it. If you're seeing differences of five, eight degrees, then it's the location of the thermometer. I think the thermometer is telling you what the temperature is in that spot. So I'm not sure if that really helped you. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I'm no hurricane expert at all, but uh, my understanding is that hurricanes that happened this year, well, last year, um, RV, et cetera, there were some unusual things about them, like the amount of rain that happened with RV. Mm -hmm. And then there was one more, like after the three hit the U.S., that sort of went up the right side of the Atlantic higher than, or, or, than you know, it has been recorded before. So do you... Do you, can you shed any light or do you understand those hurricanes, were they in your mind too? Or? Yep, um, so a couple of things. Um, Hurricane Harvey in Houston produced a similar amount of rain to a couple of other tropical storms that didn't have names because it was before the naming period. Um, and uh, the flooding in those was actually more severe. However, there were fewer people. And so it affected fewer people uh, in terms of that. Um, it, it was a, an absolutely noteworthy event, probably something um, in, you know, in the magnitude of every 50 or 60 years that something like that would happen in Texas. Texas is actually, uh, it's unfortunately an ideal spot for that sort of thing to happen because of the curve of the coastline. It actually, it promotes the possibility that a storm will get stuck there and sit there and rain for day after day. Um, so. It's, it's a rare event. Um, it was predicted ahead of time. Um, so uh, there were a couple of, of different meteorologists that I was paying attention to that, that were talking about 
the specifics of that, and again, having to do with the shape of the coastline and a few other uh, atmospheric dynamics that were going on. Um, in, ter in terms of um, the hurricane that hit Ireland, um, unusual, but certainly not the first time, uh, I can't remember the name of it, and it was in the 1960s, but another storm came up and did almost the exact same thing to Ireland and England back in the 1960s. Again, rare event, but not uh, unprecedented. Um, most of the things that have been written about climate and hurricane and tropical storm activity indicates that there doesn't seem to be any direct connection. So in other words, if the climate warms, there doesn't seem to be um, an additional increase in tropical storm systems. They may produce more rain, but the number of storms themselves and the amount of energy involved doesn't seem to, to be any different. Um, well, it's kind of, the atmosphere has more uh, moisture in it to begin with, so that may be, that may poss possibly, yes. So, in general, you would agree that um, uh, the storms that we've seen in the past have During the past 2,000 years, I would say, yes. Okay. And you would agree that greenhouse gases trap heat mm -hmm. and keep it from returning back above the atmosphere. And therefore, it would seem likely that that's a cause for the Earth to be warming. But you're not sure about that last point? There, Because there are multiple things that are going on, the sun and its changes, the ocean and its changes, um, I actually saw a presentation um, that tried to, dis to, to parse out how much did the ocean contribute to, to the climate, how much did the sun contribute to the climate, how much did humans contribute to the climate, and his estimate was that 30% of the climate change we've observed in the past 100 years, 30% was due to humans. His estimate? Hmm? Who is the person? Joseph Vallejo. He started the Weather Channel along with John, John Coleman. Yes. So, um, then I guess my last question is, um, you're talking about water vapor as if it's just kind of a phenomenon, but we know that increased heat in the Earth's atmosphere causes more water vapor in the atmosphere, yeah. and thus a much wetter storm cycle, and, and mm -hmm. increased precipitation, which I think has been pretty well predicted for New England as a result of Right. But one of the things that we don't know is if you warm, if you warm and increase the moisture in the Arctic, you would get more snowfall. Well, the factor in the Arctic is that we're getting, we're getting the polar vortex is wobbling now, so we're going to get more cold air down here. And that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, it's not a question of, of whether it's happening or not. Uh, it's a question of, of, of attributing Right. Um, so one of the things that they, they have noticed, and this specifically about the sun, is that during times of low sun, sunspot numbers, that that is a more common atmospheric arrangement, is to have what we call blocking weather patterns, which often involve um, high pressure actually sitting over the Arctic, and some of these, what is usually in the Arctic, extends southward. And that's something that they've been, they've actually... Yes, um, but, and it is related to, and again, we, we don't know the exact mechanisms, but it happens every time that there are low sunspot numbers, and currently there are low sunspot numbers. So I would expect weather extremes. Um, I, I think that's probably a pretty likely scenario over the next several years. You yourself said that nobody knows the effect of sunspots on the Earth's We don't know the mechanism. It's one of those, you know, it, so in other words, it, until scientists know the mechanism, then we can't predict what's going to happen. We can, we can make some guesses and, and, and so forth, which is, is a form of prediction, but to truly create you know, a, an accurate, um, uh, scientifically vi uh, viable sort of prediction process, we have to understand why it happens. So we, don't, we, don't, we haven't been able to, you know, we can say, okay, when there are low sunspot numbers, we get these wider variations in how the jet stream works then you have to ask the question why, and we haven't been able to answer the question yet. We're working.
Yes. Uh, it's, uh, this is more of a weather question, and concern of uh, thought is that uh, thunderstorms, kind of, we see them coming down in river valleys, mm -hmm. and I have a friend who says, no, that, that's not the case because uh, it's, it's occurring so many thousand feet up in the air. Is there any correlation between river valleys and the movement of thunderstorms? Nope, I'm afraid your friend's right. <laughs> Um, one of the things, of course, you know, with the Connecticut Valley being north and south, usually the wind before preceding a cold front, which generally creates the thunderstorms, is usually coming from the south. So the movement of storms coming up from the south just happens to be how our, our valley is oriented. Um, it wouldn't work, for example, um, if you lived uh, next to the Ohio River. <laughs> okay, so it wouldn't follow it as well. So, yeah, it is happenstance as we know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, something that you said about uh, the change in sunspot activity, it mm -hmm. gets lower, there's an increased result of the effects of cosmic uh, radiation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I may have heard from some too, but I was wondering uh, what is the difference in the quality of the energy coming into the system between the sunspot kind of energy and the effect of the cosmic? Right, yeah. Um, so so he's, he's asking, you know, what, what about the um, decrease in sunspot activity? How does that relate to the cosmic rays? And, and the way they understand it is when the sun has fewer sunspots and therefore it's putting out less energy, it actually decreases the Earth's magnetic field around it. Or I should, it's not the magnetic field, it's the effect of the magnetic field on the sun's energy coming in. And because that decreases, it allows more cosmic rays to come in. Does that make, uh, in terms of the mechanism? So, so in other words, if, if the sun is putting out more energy, those energetic particles are trapped inside our magne magnetic field and they absorb the cosmic rays before they can come in. Less sun activity, less charged particles around the earth, more cosmic rays come through. Now, in terms of, you know, so following that, what they were able to replicate in laboratory was that cosmic rays can help actually create cloud cover. It has to do with how the, it breaks apart molecules and all kinds of fussy things. But. I guess that's one question. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why that's different from the energy of the sun coming in. Oh, because cosmic rays are, are, are a much higher energy um, particle. Yeah, so, so, that, so that, and so they're able to break apart some of the molecules and that creates the reaction. Okay, is that the Yeah. 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 Have you given any thought to the total supply of water on our planet? And it, has it changed appreciably since life began? Ah, we are in a closed system. The same water that was dropping on the dinosaurs is dropping on us or going through us or whatever um, yeah this used to be part of a dinosaur um, it, it is a, a closed system um, so, so in other words so there's you know it occasionally gets tied up you know if there's a, a large global ice age it gets you know more of the fresh waters tied up in in the ice the what the plastic? Oh, 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 no, no, not the plastic. I'm, yeah, I was talking about the water in there. Um, <laughs> so, but, but yeah, um, basically the amount of water that we have is the amount of water that we've had for a few billion years. Which makes water the new gold. Which makes water the new gold. Ah, well, yes, because of all the things that we do and improper things that we do, we take water for granted around here, but there are certainly places Cape Town, that don't have that same luxury. Um, and so many of the decisions that we've made about water, uh, some of it is even based on climate cycles. So one of the things I hear about, oh my goodness, water droughts Texas. I remember, that was about three or four years ago. Oh no, Texas is in a perma drought. No, <laughs> it was a really dry year, but it wasn't a drought like the 1930s. Um, again, I think that's the, the difference between media latching onto a weather event and creating additional confusion, confusion in terms of climate. 
uh, the Western U.S. has a long history of periodic droughts, some of them short-term, some of them uh, long-term. And of course, we've created a society out there, oh, the golf courses out there. Um, you know, there shouldn't be golf courses out in Phoenix, I'm sorry. You know, Phoenix is a lovely place, but it's... <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, there, there are a lot of questionable things that we do, but... So. Okay. It's 12 o'clock. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Around a few minutes. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, but folks have questions. Before you leave, we have, do we have three more in this series? Three more uh, sessions in this series that I described before. If you can and want to pay for them, uh, we'll be out in the front if you haven't. Uh, what we use that money for is for our environmental education programs in the school so that we can send environmental educators from the Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center. Patty is here from the Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center, so if you want to check in with her. So that we can send educators into the school so that they're getting programs like this and the kids can come to the programs too whenever they want. And um, so uh, we're really glad you came. Is there anything else I need to... If we have a weather event again, just um, please uh, check our website, dumberstonconservation.com. We'll have it on the radio. We'll have it uh, as, as if we know in time, we can have it in the, in the print media, but usually we don't know in time. Always check BCTV. That's another place that you can look. This program, if you want to watch it again, will be up on BCTV in uh, probably June, two weeks, two weeks. So that's like a lot more exposure. So people who can't come during the daytime to programs like this, they can, uh, can learn what we've learned this morning. So any questions for me? Anyone? All right, come again.